In the second millennium BC, the chariot burst upon the battlefields of the Middle East. Up to this time, battles were fought by opposing lines of infantry, slugging it out on foot. Did the arrival of the highly mobile chariot give the armies that used it an advantage? No one knows the precise role played by the chariot on the battlefield. But tantalizing clues have been left to us by the ancient Assyrians. Although no remains of their chariot survive, they carved detailed pictures in stone. The chariot was an impressive symbol of royal power, but was it also a decisive instrument of war? To find out, a team of experimenters will, for the first time, build and test chariots on the battlefields of the ancient Assyrian Empire. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! We're going to break the pole! Look, no, 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 no. This isn't going to work at According to the Bible, Assyria was a land bathed in blood. Beginning in the 9th century BC, the Assyrian army swept through the Middle East, creating the world's first completely militarized state. With an army of more than 100,000 men, a succession of despotic warrior kings built an empire on blood and loot. Within 200 years, Assyria had grown from a small city-state north of present-day Baghdad into the greatest empire of the time. The British Museum in London contains the most comprehensive records of the Assyrian war machine. A team of investigators has come here to examine some wall reliefs that originally decorated the palaces of the Assyrian kings. Do you know whether that's clear? They hope to find clues about how the chariots were built to withstand the rigors of battle. These alabaster panels are the only evidence that carriage maker and wheelwright Robert Herford will have to go on. He will build the chariots that will eventually be road tested on the plains of southern Turkey. Got, got the beginnings of an idea here of how we might put this thing together. These are a lot bigger, these wheels, aren't they? And, uh, do you know, to me, that chariot looks simpler in, in its construction. He's about four foot high, isn't he? And the king there must be about seven foot. Yeah, it does look a bit like And with imagine. a big hat. On. Yes, it does. Jonathan Waterer is an expert horse trainer, and he's checking the wall reliefs for how the ponies were harnessed to the chariot. I mean, I have no clue what Assyrian ponies are like. I mean, maybe, maybe they're terribly wild sort of ponies, so I really don't know what we're going to be ending up training. Um, the harness is very challenging. I've never, ever been involved in um, getting ponies hitched onto a vehicle, uh, no less a chariot, uh, with a neck yoke. They were the most ingenious people, weren't they? Yeah, they were. Mike Lodes is an ancient weapons expert who will be leading the chariots into battle. Neck forks. We need to understand more about how is the chariot deployed on the battlefield. How do you, how do you actually work in it? How, how effective is it? How many arrows can you drop into a zone? Well, I'm, I'm hoping like mad that everything works well. I, I can't remember having failed badly over anything, anything of this kind, but you never know. Ah, one lives in fear of such moments. On the banks of the Euphrates, in southern Turkey, is Halfeti, known locally as the village of a hundred horses. The team's horse trainer, Jonathan Waterer, has arrived in advance to select the ponies that will be trained to pull the chariots. Looks like the whole village is here. 
But Jonathan's a West Country farmer who still uses horses for everything from ploughing to pulling hearses. Ought we to be jumping on board and having a little trot? All right, all right, now, come on. He needs seven horses of similar size, strength, and sex. Jonathan has five weeks to train the horses. He's choosing mares, as they can usually be taught more quickly than stallions. Come on, back. Come on. I thought you said this was fast. Come on. Oh, hey. oh. Stops. Oh. The horses employed by the Assyrian charioteers were small, pony sized by our standards. We're not going to win the derby with this one. I think this one's a bit small and a little bit too steady. <laughs> we need one that goes forwards, really. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. The four greys we definitely want. The bay we keep in mind. When we've looked to the others tomorrow, we, we can make up our mind whether we want that other bay. An hour's drive to the east of Halfetti is Urfa. It's the biggest city in the region. Jonathan has arranged to meet Robert Herford here. In the old market, they begin the search for craftsmen who will help build the chariots. I'm very well. I'm good. This is But first, Robert has to solve a major design problem. I'm fairly sure the thing isn't going to be quite as strong as I'd like. These things have got to be very robust. They're going to move fast, they're going to have um, rough ground to go over, they're going to turn, um, and the ponies are going to be doing all sorts of things up the front there, uh, which put strains on the structure. And we've got to make it strong. The sculptures show a weak link where the draft pole connects to the chariot by a bracket. And I have a strong suspicion that there's some framework inside this thing. Robert is convinced that a mysterious feature called the pea pod hides a structure which strengthens the pole that attaches the horses to the chariot. I managed to put it into a structure, which in itself is quite strong um, in that way. I think the big pole, the, the, the main pole, which divides into two, does quite a lot this way. And I think that helps it a great deal with the the sort of vertical pressures. Um, so together, the two of them, I hope, will make a unified structure out of it, which is strong enough, I hope, to do its job. Anyway, we'll build it and see. But first, Robert needs to find a chariot builder in modern-day Turkey. Across town is a workshop run by the Girit brothers. They specialize in making wooden furniture by bending wooden poles into the most incredible shapes. The process begins with steaming the native sweet chestnut for several hours to soften the wood. By bending the wood in this way, they're convinced they can build Robert's chariot. It's really jolly nice having three chaps around who know what they're doing. I'm kind of worried about this. Not of I want to drop it down somehow. The heat softened wood can only take so much bending. We've got, yes, we've got an amazing capacity to just adjust the bend a bit. It'll only go in one direction. You can't sort of tighten it up once you've, once you've released the bend and, and, and brought the thing nearer to the straight bit of wood that it was originally. You can tell a lot from the sound of a bit of wood. Uh. The chariots will be tested south of Urfa, close to the Syrian border. In ancient times, Haran was an important crossroads on the trade routes that fueled the Assyrian Empire. Jonathan will train the horses here, and it looks as if it's going to be hard work. Yeah, that... Hello, we might just stand back out of the way of that one. That's a good shot. 
you know, how it hand with your hind feet. I think once they know you mean business and you're kind to them, hopefully, we'll get them all going. The best thing is to give them some work and some kindness and some food and all the rest of it, and they get to know me. That's that's the main thing. And then hopefully, um, you know, the project's going to be reasonably successful. That's what we're looking for. Horses have always been an essential part of life around here. Perhaps the ancestors of these bad-tempered mares carried the Assyrians into battle. Come on. Come on, good girl. Good girl, good girl. That's it. Come on. Back in Urfa, Robert is tackling his next problem, putting wheels on his chariot. He's come to the market where leather, metal and wood are still worked by hand. He finds Mustafa Selva, an ex-wrestler who usually makes baby cribs, but he was happy to turn his hand to Assyrian chariot wheels. The wall reliefs show wheels which appear to have wide wooden tires attached to a very puny-looking hub or stock. It's a design that looks very likely to fall apart. This is the stock we're going to use. I have a slight worry that we might... It's very thin, actually. The section's very thin. We're, we're following what we think is the ancient Assyrian pattern. I don't want it to split as we put spokes in. I mean, well, it don't want them too tight. But we must have it tight enough. And the next stage, we, we put the wheel uh, down. You've cut the tongues. Now we've got the, the rim part to, to mark out. And with a bit of luck, it'll fit round those tongues. A Turkish wrestler's ideal, actually, for this job. Yeah, we, I, we're not onto the knock there. The wooden tyre is made of several planks, and there's a good chance that they'll come apart under the stresses of cornering. In the way that the dowels have, we can... That's it. Robert is certain that the Assyrian wheelwrights must have found a way around this problem. Right, there we are. Let's see how we, uh, how we get the things together now. The... Right. Oh, well, we've got the inside a bit big, or perhaps the outside a bit small. It had been my fault. I measured the blessed thing in the first place. We... We do not want you getting... How oh, well, I... No. This mare we're a little bit worried about because uh, she tried to kick me pretty hard yesterday and she caught our friend here on the back. She's just rather nasty temper, that one, for whatever reason. OK? That one? Yeah. Ha. Um, and that one? And that one? Oh, oh, oh. oh. that one's bad. Because of their fiery temperament, the ancient charioteers used stallions. In an impulsive moment, Jonathan decided to add a stallion to his team of mares. Once they know each other, they'll be fine. The Assyrian charioteers never mixed males and females. Come on, come on. They're going on fine. The stallion quickly earns the name Mejnoun after Turkey's Romeo. Robert is still wrestling with the problem of how to stop the wheels falling apart. It's been drying for a day or two. He thinks the Assyrian wheelwrights may have used a secret ingredient, rawhide. Rawhide is uncured cowhide. Not pleasant to handle when wet and slimy, but when it dries out, it shrinks and becomes very hard. This is sort of changing a tire, Assyrian style. Right, I've just brought that out of their drying cupboard. It's been in overnight, and the rawhides getting pretty hard. This tire now has shrunk lots and I'm hoping it's, it's pulled all these joints together. So it, it's going to do its job. The other area of weakness in the wheel design is the union of spokes and hub. Robert hopes rawhide may stop the spokes from falling out. Uh, and then we're going to put um, a big sort of glove of rawhide. As it dries, it'll Hopefully, shrink everything together and pull these spokes in nicely. 
I think it's rather a daft design. I really can't understand why they've got this deep bit here. Um, but the big problem with them is, at the moment at least, is, is to get a good union in this part of the uh, design. Robert has asked the Girrett brothers to come up with a ring of bent wood to lock the tower onto the rim. Jonathan trains the horses to work together. Before they can be attached to chariots, there's a vital missing link. Gail Brownrigg is an expert in ancient harnesses, and she's brought over her interpretation of an Assyrian yoke system for Jonathan to try out. I guessed that because they're animals that are, are coming from a hot country, they'll probably be yeah. fairly slender in build. Yes. So I've asked for this to be narrower. Right. Mm. That is impressive. Yes, that looks like Yokes like these have not been used for 2,000 years. And this will be an unfamiliar experience for the horses. Whoa, 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 whoa. Shall I undo? No, no, leave them on. They're right. They'll be all right. I think we'll actually put the reins on now. These people had lots more experience than we've got. This first. Another member of the team is Joost Kruhl, an archaeologist from Amsterdam University. He's the world's leading authority on chariots. May I make a suggestion? Yes, of course. I think it may all be better if the yoke saddles were fitted the other side. ahead of yes, the yoke. Yes, I think you're right. Yeah. I'd like to try that in a moment. I yes. just want to show... I have an idea. There is some debate about the design because the ancient reliefs don't show all the details. The yoke saddle then pushes yes, against the yoke. Yeah, it right. is pushing against the yoke. It might be. Because the yoke is going forward. And I think if we bring this back, it's going to be on the sensitive part of the horse. This bit's bony. Yeah. Ah. Shh. Ah. All right. Put her down. Come and feel here. Yeah, Come I know and feel. what you mean, but this... This should then be here. Isn't it? No, the yoke saddle won't move. What will move is the yoke. Oh. And if you bring the yoke right. back here, mm. come and feel. Yoke, come yeah, and feel. Yeah, you were right. Here is yeah. bony. Well, yeah. Bony. Yeah. Here is soft muscle. Mm. And that is why I thought the further forward we can put this, this is going to stay in place. Yes, it has because to it press sits against these bones, yes. This won't move. Yeah. Does it spoil the whole system? Where Jonathan stands on the chariot also affects how the yokes sit on the horse's shoulders. No, it's better when there's just a certain amount of weight. As soon as there's yes. no weight on the yoke, mm. all the pull is on here. Right. Maybe we need to tighten it all up then. I think we need yes. the whole thing tight. Yes. Come on. Come on. Shh. Thank you, old devil. Come on. Come on. Come on. Shh. Come on. Shh. The next member of the team to arrive in Haran is Mike Lodes. My background is as a weapons historian and also as an action arranger, and it, it's bringing those two roles together that I hope to get some feeling for how these chariots were actually used in battle, because we've got a lot of pictorial reference as to what they might have looked like, but we have virtually no evidence at all as to how they were actually deployed on the battlefield. So with practical tests, actually, shooting arrows from galloping chariots. I hope to be able to draw some conclusions or at least put some data into the public domain so we can interpret how they might have been used. The ancient pictures of chariots always show the kings of Assyria heroically vanquishing their enemies. But were the ancient charioteers always so successful in battle? The scholars studying these reliefs have come up with different theories about chariot tactics. One idea is that chariots were used as a shock weapon. Chariots charged directly at the enemy line in an attempt to intimidate and break the will to stand firm. Another interpretation is that the chariot was used as a mobile missile launching platform. The bow was the primary weapon of the Assyrian army. The chariot was simply there to serve the archer 
all chariots had archers. They were there to manoeuvre the archer around the battlefield. Tomorrow, Mike will have an opportunity to try shooting from a chariot. With the wood-bending phase complete, all that remains to be done is some leather work, lashing the poles and cladding the sides of the platform. There's beginning to be some strength in this structure, surprisingly so. That fills me with hope. I don't know if the wheels do yet. The deadline's impossible, but we'll just have to keep going quickly and um, see how lucky we become. You never know, there may be good fortune around the corner and the thing might get finished on time. I think every job's a bit touch and go, really. Fortune seems to have favoured Robert. And the next morning, the chariots are delivered to the test site just outside Haran. But in the rush to get ready, one job has been neglected. No one has come up with a permanent method for anchoring the yoke forks. Robert's hoping to cobble something together with leftover strips of leather. Let's see. Is this a la Hotel Harat? We have the butter. This is the producer's butter. Very good. Well, let's see. Is absolutely worn out. I'm afraid he must have served every mare. He served three mares about three times a day for the last four days. Um, it seems to be in the culture here that you just let the horse get on with it, which drives me nearly up the wall. So he's now not much good for anything. Let's start. After five weeks of preparation, Jonathan is ready to roll. Quite know how this is all going to pan out. We still are ready to go. Yeah. Okay, go on then. Major, go on. Go on, man. Go on. Go on. Major, go on. But immediately, on. the yoke yeah. fails. Oh, straight away again, yeah. isn't it? Oh, shh. Which hers is all right, isn't it? Absolutely. How are we going to do? There's nothing wrong with the horses at all. It's this no. blasted neck yoke. This stuff is just too loose. <laughs> the main problem we're having is that these, the neck yoke fork, particularly on this side, is, is going underneath like this. Now, if only this was fixed on here originally, it couldn't do that. We're also having trouble with the pea pod. Um, that's actually come unlashed on the front of the yoke. Well, what's happened here is, is that the, the yoke's ridden forward and the pea pod's gone in behind. The lashings have dropped off the end of the pea pod. So we didn't get that right when we were doing it. Um, we're going to have to have a little, uh, a little bit of a running repair here. If Robert can't fix the yokes, today's tests may have to be abandoned. <laughs> when the speed trials finally get underway, they quickly discover that two horse chariots are fast and easily manoeuvrable across rough, open ground. The Assyrian army was famous for its rapid response during long military campaigns. Sometimes they crossed mountain ranges to hunt down an enemy. The chariots were light enough to be carried by a pair of charioteers. Other potential obstacles were rivers. The Assyrian Empire was bisected by two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. But the ancient wall reliefs suggest that even large rivers were no barrier to the chariot corps. Chariots are shown floating across in small boats with horses in tow. Jonathan has come to the Euphrates to find out how difficult it is to emulate an Assyrian army river crossing. I'm not quite sure how I got this job, actually. Based on research into ancient river craft, he's come up with a design for a goatskin covered boat. We really mustn't go near this edge. Someone is going to get wet. If we make a hole in here, we're really in trouble. OK? OK. Right. We haven't sunk yet. The next step is to persuade the horses to have a swim, too. Sit down there, like that, and then row... Where are we going to row? Here. 
I wouldn't be in here myself if it was going to hurt me. Good boy. Come on. If I can swim, you can as well. Come on. Oh. Come on. That's a good boy. Come on. Come on. Good boy. Come on. Boy, it's cold in here. Whose idea was it? Good. Good boy. Good boy. I'm quite pleased with it. You know, I feel, as I say, quite confident that this could be yes. done. I, I would be quite sure I could do it myself, even mm. today. OK, the horse is coming. The war reliefs show individual soldiers guiding horses while simultaneously blowing into the goatskin that is supporting them. God, the Assyrians must have had more puff than I have. I tell you, that's pretty hard work. I'm rather pleased we got this, um, excuse me, foot pump. Um, I think we might put the foot pump back in, but I think it would be quite possible to do. OK. And there we are. One inflated goat skin, obviously head, feet. This would be the tail end down here. Um, it looks to me pretty good. I think it would, I think it will work. I don't see why not. I think in the relief it shows somebody on it here, swimming with one hand. I, I can't imagine how you do that, but we ought to try it, oughtn't we? Um, and just see if it is at all possible. Let's just get on and do it. Well, I think it works very well. I think I'm pulling the lawn, aren't I? Well, so much problem with that, my goat skin's going down. Uh, <laughs> when I started, that was definitely excellent, and I felt very buoyant. As it went down, I was having to just hold it up a bit. <laughs> um, I think you'd swim across here with horses, no problem at all with this, especially if you were near the coracles and you could grab the side every now and again. I think that would have worked very well. To maintain control over its conquered territories, the Assyrian army was constantly on the move. River crossings must have become quite routine. When the chariot corps engaged with an enemy, it's not clear how they were deployed. Used Cruel is convinced that opposing chariots never directly attacked each other. They have a wide wheelbase, the axles stick out, they're very vulnerable. If they come into too near to each other, they might collide, and then both parties will go to pieces. Certainly. But is, is, isn't the fact that there could be an accident, isn't that ever the case in war? If cavalry are charging each other and, you know, warriors take risks on the battlefield? True, but one man on a horse is something different from two or three men on a chariot and drawn by two or three or four horses. It's much more expensive, it requires much more training. It's different. But it's down to the skill of the charioteer and its manoeuvrability, which is what we're going to test. Did it work? Well, I managed to touch the driver and I also managed to touch a horse. For the purpose of this, we used a rubber end because we were going against right. live beings. Yeah. But if you're worried about me being knocked out, I'll try it with a sharp spare against one of these targets. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Whether it was done, I cannot know, but I think that does show it could have been done. It's not a limitation of the weapons or the engineering of the vehicle. On the battlefield, enemy archers would always go for the chariot horses first. They are at their most vulnerable at the moment that they're making the turn. Not only are the teams slowing in order to make the turn, but they're coming along broadside. A large, soft target, very inviting to the enemy archers. What we see on the reliefs is that they would have teams of three horses. But the third horse, the outside horse as it makes the turn, is not coupled to the other horses, nor is it coupled to the chariot. Assuming that that horse has been a deflective shield, a sacrificial horse, it's been shot, he's simply going to release it and make good his escape with the team intact. I believe that the chariot never charged in formation. 
against an unbroken enemy line. That was too dangerous for both the chariots and the horses. The horses are very vulnerable. They should never pose as a, an easy target for the enemy uh, archers. They should come and go. The factor of surprise was very important. And they also were useful in harassing and pursuing an enemy on the march or an enemy in defeat. The great thing about the chariot is its versatility. We've shown you can shoot from a jolting, bumping, moving platform. So the archer on the chariot is a viable and valuable warrior. The whole chariot is set up to it very well, but I think the biggest improvement would be not to use leather lashings. You can see now, after two or three days, quite heavy use, it's coming loose. Now, if this was all rawhide, as the platform is, feel, you know, that platform was very, very tight still, and this would never move. I don't think you'd have any movement in this chariot at all. Um, you know, imagine all this done with rawhide. You can see you can just move, you shouldn't be able to move all this around. It was very, very tight when we started, and little bits, you know, it's all just getting a bit loose. Um, but I think the actual design of the chariot, I'm sure we've proved, is perfectly good for, for warfare. In the middle of the 8th century BC, the Assyrians came up with the idea of transferring archers from chariots to horseback. The war reliefs from the time show that fighting from a horse took some getting used to. Curiously, when they first started doing this, they did it in pairs. In other words, they stayed in their chariot teams. So the chariot driver drove both horses. I won't have my reins. I'm going to be giving my reins to Jonathan, which is rather a frightening prospect to be sitting here with no reins galloping along and I don't have any stirrups, and they're riding bare back. And I absolutely have to trust my driver to be driving both the horses. Get up! Get up! This is not easy, is it? Ha! It's all right. Well, it's harder than we think, isn't it? That's for sure. It's going to be bloody impossible. Bouncing all over the place. Yeah. There! Get on! Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I enjoy oh. excitement. Yeah. We better, so we better do it again. You got any more thrills for me? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Way. <laughs> Excellent. Mike is convinced that the appearance of textured saddle blankets explains why mounted archers graduated to riding alone. My belief is that this enables them to move forward on the horse, where you're better able to influence the horse's direction with your balance. But because these horses are so narrow, they need this saddle blanket and this extra thick felt padding to bulk it out. Otherwise, your, your, your pincer grip with your legs becomes very, very tiring. So I need this to give it some bulk. Also, the rough texture of this, I hope, is going to give me some friction to allow me just to take my weight off the horse at the moment of loosing. There! Whoosh! Extraordinary difference. It was much better. I really was able just to lift off enough. I felt much more in control than I had done as a paired archer. So this is undoubtedly a step forward. Just as the Assyrians and their enemies are getting the hang of fighting from horseback, the wall reliefs from the time show a very bizarre development on the chariot front. The pictures show that the lightweight two-horse Assyrian chariot is replaced by a heavy four-horse juggernaut, carrying four warriors. The charioteers and horses are all heavily armored. But despite the additional equipment, the chariot is still only carrying one archer. One explanation is that the Assyrians were trying to turn the chariot itself into a tank that could crash through an enemy line. But no one knows the tactical role played by the four-horse chariot, or why the Assyrians would still build chariots now that the cavalry had arrived. To find out more about the four-horse chariot, Robert will attempt to build one. We've got 
One great big puzzle, though, which is this, this yoke at the front for the four horses abreast. Uh, we've got two or three illustrations of it. I've made that model, which we've now got to translate into a full-size thing. To try and solve the puzzle of fabricating the yoke, Robert sets up another appointment with the Girid brothers. But there's a problem. They don't have a long enough piece of wood for the yoke, so it'll have to be made from two sections. Yeah, sure. And if you take three of them, yeah, but this right. thing becomes immensely long. I mean, yeah. it's eight foot. It's yeah, eight it foot six nine. or yeah, nine. Is it? Yeah, it is, isn't that with the for the yoke to fit snugly on the horses' necks, the bends in the pole will have to be very tight. It's hard to see if it does work yeah. at all. Even the chaps here, who know what they're doing when they're steering things, um, are yes. saying. Um, things that make, yeah, make you think measure. that they're wondering about it. Right. This is the first time the Girrett brothers have attempted such tight bends. It'll take great skill not to crack the sweet chestnut sapling as they force it around the jig. The ancient Assyrian chariot builders would have used similar methods to heat and bend wood. It's not an easy job, this is. Yeah. We've got a failure here and a failure here. We've got a collapse here and a failure here. But they'll go, won't they? I mean, you'll get a good one next time you try it. But these chaps are confident that they can do it. So I dare say they'll have another go. And um, perhaps even another one after that. And we'll get it right in the end. A Syrian craftsman probably had available a longer pole from which to make the yoke. Laminating pieces together to get the full length will probably make this yoke much heavier than that of the ancients. Yeah, that's, tight. that's tightening up a bit now. We've done it now. Yeah, we have. That's better. Now, have Robert is once again using rawhide for the floor of the chariot. I can pin them, nail them. It acts as a shock absorber for the charioteers, and when the rawhide I mean, dries, massive. it'll shrink and hold the platform it together. Shrinks, it drags all these joints together because it pulls in both. After several long days, Robert must now work through the night to complete the job. For such a heavy chariot, the pole that connects the four horses to the platform is looking very skinny. This is the thing I really In preparation for tomorrow's trials, Jonathan has arrived with a request for further modifications to the yoke. There's something that's concerning me a bit. I know it's very crucial to get this shape bang on because otherwise, if they're too wide, the horses just sort of walk through them. They've got to be actually on their neck. And I'm looking here, and this one looks very good. And I'm looking at that end, and I think maybe that one's right. I'm just wondering about these ones here. They look a bit wide to me. Mm. I think we're going to have to glue a piece of packing in there. Everyone will be ever so pleased. They've, uh, well, I've been up half the night so far. I've just know. come back, and we start to look at it and criticise. I know, but I, you know, I know I've been very insistent from the start. We we have to have this shape because we know this fits the horses. That's better, isn't it? The clever thing to do would be to put it around there, wouldn't it? So if I drop now, if I drop it down, if I can I have it back? Now what's going on here? Aren't these chariots finished yet? Certainly not. What? God, you've had days and nights. Well, they're still not finished. Oh, come on, Jonathan. <laughs> no, perfectly well. What are you doing? Popping nobody a pole does on anything them. until the last <laughs> minute in this world. What are you doing? Popping a pole on or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought I'd put the quivers on. Shall we lift the vehicle up? Let, yeah, let's, let's, let's. The wheels of the heavy four-horse chariot have additional spokes and iron rims. They also wobble a lot. That's one. Little bit there of use. There should be some play, though. Well, there needs to be some, but I, I think there's too much. Uh -huh. But it's be quite a lot, doesn't there? Yeah, there is. Mind hmm. you, 
Yeah. The Smithfield Market barrows used to have lots of play. And they, yes. they used to clap yeah. around on yeah, their Yeah, but axles. they didn't go at about 15 miles an hour, did they? No, but you see, <laughs> I used to, I used to think this looks, this looks silly, this, this uh, it's, it's it's corners, isn't it? But don't you worry, it's only going to be me driving it, well, so don't you gonna... concern yourself uh, one little bit. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite a wide nave on here. Is there a reason? These, obviously, these plain... Um, simple cylinders had to have uh, wood on wood bearings. They had right. to have uh, a long bearing in right. order to withstand the stresses they were put to. Right. This one's 14 inches long. Yes. I think. Yes. Um, Interesting. The thing I noticed today hasn't this leather shrunk up this raw height? Hasn't it really pulled this wheel together? Very different to, to how it was before that went on. Well, <clears throat> you know, I feel the, the pole really. I mean, it is terribly flimsy when you when you actually think about other sort of vehicles that horses pull all over the world. It's very flimsy. But somehow all this binding, and there's a lot of raw hide in amongst here, binding it onto the vehicle, you know, it, it, it's probably way stronger than we think it is. <laughs> so I don't know whether I'm going to be able to hold this up. Maybe we're going to be... The yoke has turned into the mother of all yokes. God, and it'll be a heavy burden for the horses. So could, oh, no, where are the horses we need? Yeah. We need... Oh, God. OK, let me have this one. That's it. Well done. That's it. That's good. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. That's it. Good girl. Well done. All right. Oh. Well done. Come on, then. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Come on. Oh, we Let me just lift that up now. I'll let you go that side. Yeah. OK? Let's just... The four-horse chariot, four horses yoked yeah. in a solid yoke. Yeah. Seemed to me to be the most unwieldy, unmanoeuvrable vehicle imaginable. Wait a minute, this isn't going to work. Two horse against a four horse chariot. It, it, it's the difference between a, a sports car and a, a heavy lorry. It, 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 one is light, fast, and manoeuvrable, and the other just really doesn't look as if it's going to have any great manoeuvrability at all, and therefore, would, I would have thought, going to limit. It, it's practical applications on the battlefield. Let him come round. All right, this man might just come round. Go on, get them around, otherwise. Go on. Right from the start, it's clear that the horses don't on, like the heavy yoke. Just pull them to get them round. Go on. Oh my God! Whoa! Oh my God! We're going to break the pole. Oh my God! Look, no, 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 no. This isn't going to work at all. Oh, I think if we can ever get them going straight, that'll be great. Hang on, let me just. Go on. Go on. Da 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 da. Go on. Oh, 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 they start going back, because you've got to stop. Oh. Just watch, you don't break everything. <laughs> That's the most Come embarrassing on. thing I've ever done. Nothing to be embarrassed about. <laughs> really. On, good girls, go on, go on, good girls, go on, go on. Go on, go on. Go on. Go on. Just, go on. Good, good girls, go on. Good, good girls, good girls. Good girls. Good girls. Good girls. Go on, go on, go on. Hold on to the okay, oh, stop. Oh, 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 that's, look, look at that pole, look at the angle it goes. That, that moves about six inches when you turn a corner. Because the pole is so flexible, it's not keeping the platform level. Hold on a minute. One problem is that the, the chariot is looking forward. It should be looking level, at least. Um, and I, it's putting a lot of weight on these horses. I'm trying to stand at the back. But, of course, they've just got, you know, these neck yokes, and there's a little bit of pull on their thorax as well, which, you know, probably interferes with their breathing just a little bit, not, not greatly, but uh, just, just every now and again, it's just doing this to them. And, you know, they're in open bridles, which they've never had to work, which they've all taken to very well. But um, <laughs> it's rather hard work. <laughs> but we'll get them going. This pole is <laughs> bloody bendy. Oh, is it? Bendy. Really whippy? That is never going to take any strain at all. This Hit pole it. is going to break, I can tell you now. Ah. Watch out, you lot. Sorry, I can't do it any other way. Grab the heads, have the heads, have the heads, heads! God, heads! What the hell's the word for head in this language? Oh. Sorry, heads, so they don't go back. OK. It quickly becomes clear that the four-horse chariot was not an all-terrain vehicle. No, the idea that the chariot was used in warfare as something like a modern tank is a fallacy. They are much too uh, uh, vulnerable and they needed open and level terrain. So, having successfully introduced mounted archers, 
Why would the Assyrians continue to build expensive chariots that could only operate on level terrain and only carried one archer? One possibility is that mounted troops became more and more important. And in order to preserve some function of the traditional, very prestigious vehicle, which was used on the whole by the aristocracy, the higher ups of society, they changed its role and more stationary mobile uh, firing platform. We know from the reliefs that the large chariot made a handy platform to hunt lions. But it's hard to think of a useful battlefield role for it, other than providing well-armored transport for the king. Hop, 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 hop! Go on, man! Oh, go on! I think, you know, the, the chariot itself is absolutely fine, but it is just this yoke. We just haven't got it very comfortable for them, basically. And they're just, they're just feeding every movement, and then one just holds back a little bit, then another, and then one goes, and it's just a little bit hard to get them all happy and going together. Martha, we're all wasting time. You'll be here all day. We're not going to make them go any better, I don't think. Cavalry made chariots obsolete as a battlefield weapon. The Assyrian army hung onto them longer than most other Middle Eastern states, probably because their spectacular appearance gave prestige to their owners. For hundreds of years, chariots continued to be the transport of choice for kings and generals. Eventually, the Assyrian army became overextended. After 250 years of rapid expansion, the empire disintegrated. In 612 BC, the Babylonians and their allies sacked the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. The yoke of three centuries of Assyrian domination of the Middle East was broken. Long after the chariot ceased to be used in battle, chariot racing continued as a popular spectator sport. The team couldn't resist a taste of Ben-Hur on their last day. They were galloping, and I would think they must have been doing over 20 miles an hour. We've got major problems here. His wheel fell off, and mine's fallen apart. So we've just had one good old belt down there and did a bit of high-speed cornering, and mine's, um, well, actually, it's about to fall apart, literally. His, at least, is back on the axle. Oh, bloody chain. The wooden tyre around the actual felly is, is coming apart. Well, this is only nailed on. If that was actually riveted on, there's no way that would come out. The Assyrians were the ultimate charioteers. The sound of chariots has not echoed around here since the last of the Assyrian kings fled to Haran, before the final collapse of the empire.